Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here, excited today to have Francis Valentine with us. Francis, welcome to Trending in Ed. Thank you, Mike. It's so fantastic to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe you are the first native of New Zealand that I've had on the show, the first kiwi, which we were talking a little bit about the kiwi earlier, which is an interesting bird. We may pick up on that as well, but you're also someone who's been doing really interesting work around futures thinking and designing some labs, but you founded the Mind Lab and the Tech Futures Lab in New Zealand. You've also written a book called Future You. You got a lot going on. Congratulations on that. We always begin by asking our guests to catch us up on their origin story. What got you to this point in your professional life? Can you catch us up on your hero's quest? I'll try. I'll, I'll definitely give that a go. Okay. So I have ended up in education 25 years ago, but actually it came from a technology lens and the technology lens was a complete mistake. I ended up as a 17 year old in London, decided to move there uh, on a one-way ticket. Not sure what I was going to do, but I was going to be somehow in the design or the creative industries. That was really my passion. And when I arrived in the late eighties in London, suddenly there was these technologies that I'd never seen before. It was a big, very beginning stage of desktop computers. People were starting to talk about what that might mean in the future. And, and I was really intrigued, this idea that you could have information democratized in a way through these new channels. And it was before the internet, obviously, for those who remember that time. And that was the beginning of this fascination with technology and then starting to understand how did people learn if there were going to be new things coming into life, but particularly things that were going to change the environment of work. In some ways, I've shifted my focus away from just pure technology to thinking about the future of work and capability mm. and how do people learn and relearn throughout their career when everybody's busy, they're trying to just make things come together on a normal day and a normal week, and yet this pressure of having constant change. And so that's really where I found my space. And over the last 25 years, I've really focused on that. What do people need to do to constantly change and adapt and feel confident about those changes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating space to be interested in and to be working on, particularly over a longer span of time. I imagine you start to see things differently because you see the future by watching something for 20 years, for example. It is interesting as well to think about how the the rate of change can change over time. The, the second derivative for calculus fans out there, the, the rate at which things are changing is accelerating. A lot of folks have been referring to the pandemic as an accelerant. I'm sure as someone who's trying to help mainly adults and leaders and, and folks in industry understand how to respond, be adaptable, be flexible, get out ahead of a rapidly changing, disruptive environment. It's got to be a really interesting and challenging situation that you've seen over the last couple of years. Can you frame up for us what it was like maybe leading into 2020 and then what it's been like for the last couple of years? Sure. And look, just going back to your point about the acceleration, you know, the, the Moore's law, the, the law of accelerating return. And it's a real thing that actually, as we become more connected to digital and in, in its every form, and the more things that we move into a zero and a one and away from human interaction and, and human driven behavior, the more it can accelerate because we're basically operating in zeros and ones. So I'm really fascinated by that as well, that we've actually created this beast, this kind of this thing where it just, you know, gets faster and faster. Mm -hmm. and, and I think going into 2020, uh, we were very fortunate that we we'd moved into the area solely of focusing on training and developing professionals. So it, it could be the, the majority were educators. So people who worked in the broader education industry, some were in health, some were in corporates. But the focus was really saying, how do we reach the maximum number of people? And, and so up until 2020, we were actually running a programs for teachers to teach them how to do uh, digital and collaborative learning in their classroom. And we were doing that in 32 locations each week. Mm. And if, you know, we're a small country, but it's still from top to bottom to drive is 20 hours. It's not yeah. that small. Mm -hmm. And so 
we were spread out everywhere. We distributed workforce. And, and then one day we said, you know what, this is getting a little crazy. We, we cannot be everywhere. Why don't we just move everything online? Mm. So thankfully, by the time the pandemic had hit, we were really well set up or ready to, to move into this fully online delivery. And, and so, you know, either good luck or good planning, uh, it depends on who I'm talking to, we were there. But I actually just want to say that even though we're teaching adults and the average age of our students is 42, they sort of stretch from 35 and above typically. And in fact, we even have scholarships for over 60s, mm. which are very uh, high demand. A lot of people over 60 doing studies with us at postgraduate level. When I started my career, my students were undergrads and I was young, they were young. And actually all I think is I'm, all I'm doing is matching my students to my life. So I get to hang out with cool people who are the same age as me. The only time I took a break out of that was when I first started the Mind Lab in 2013. It was actually for children. It was for children aged between seven and 12 to teach them about technologies and robotics and coding and getting into that. And so there was a period of time where I did teach schools and young children. And then we've, I've gone back into higher education mm -hmm. uh, since that time and really focused on this underserved market of people who are mid-career or mm. wanting to really understand what their career is going to look like in the next 5, 10, 15 years, with a particular focus on people starting to realize that retirement at 65, it's probably not very realistic if you're going to live to be 90. Mm. And, and so it's a lot of living, you know, the 25 years afterwards, what are you going to do? Right. How are you going to afford to live? Not that many people have a nest egg of a 25-year right. scope to look after themselves. So then we're really focused about making sure that people feel really confident about the changing world and actually what they can do to keep up with that yeah. world that's changing around them. Yeah. And that's very much reflected in the courses I saw on the Mind Labs website, which you were saying are, are now open internationally. So one of the, one of the benefits of going online is that you can open up your offerings to a broader population and you are now accepting international uh, applicants, which is a reason why folks may want to perk up and, and where should it folks go if they're curious about some of the, the course offerings that you're providing? Yeah. So we, we have two different brands, which is unusual uh, for an institute, but the mindlab.com. So the mind lab and tech futures lab.com. The difference between them is people who study with the mind lab typically in what I would call impact careers, education, health, social services, social development. Whereas people who study with Tech Futures Lab typically work in corporate businesses for profit. And the work they're doing is often driven by a slightly different mandate. Mm -hmm. So we, we've separated the two brands, but in the end, fundamentally, we're focused on technology, digital and disruption, sustainability in the environment, and new forms of leadership and the in economic models. Mm -hmm. So a bit of a range. Uh, and then there's a huge piece around education and training. Yeah. Well, and it is a time where if you're not upskilling, reskilling really throughout your lifespan, there's an increasing risk that your current skills and your current job capabilities will be automated, will be outmoded, and you will be in a much more difficult position that combined with the fact that at least in the U.S., and I believe this is a more global trend. I'd want to hear your perspective on this. That this notion of the great reshuffle, you know, the great resignation, <laughs> whatever, whatever great thing it is, there is something going on where the pandemic, uh, I refer to it as a forcing function, where we were all compelled to do things different. Our behavior changed. And with that, there was a lot of rethinking that began. Maybe it was underway already, but it was accelerated again to question the career trajectory that you're on. Also many jobs and industries were disrupted to the point where your job may no longer have been around or it may have been refactored. Any thoughts on, on that? Because it sounds like in some ways you're designing a lot of your products and services to address some of what's now manifested in the great resignation and the great reshuffle, the great whatever we want to call it. Yeah. When you see a major adversity event, which clearly COVID was one, and it happens in, in, in many situations, politically it happens too. When you have one extreme, you typically overcorrect and go the other extreme in the next iteration. Mm -hmm. 
And what we've seen globally is a lot of people were caught out because they were still very operating very analog systems or actually even operating their understanding of the world through a, a lens that was very legacy based. Mm -hmm. And so if we think back at pre COVID, there was a time when if there were things to do with technology or things that were a little bit digital, or a little bit more complex in that area, we lent on millennials in our workforce. We were like, oh, you're young, you can go do that. But the difference is now is millennials are now at the top end, they're 40 years old. They are leaders in their own right. And they are much more digital because they've had those years and years of growing up with the internet. And so suddenly you have a group of leaders who are in their 40s, 50s and 60s who are having to make some really big adjustments because increasingly they're working for people who are decades younger than themselves yeah. or who are talking in a language they don't understand. And so if they're sitting at the, at the table making strategic decisions or teaching a class and, the, and the, these young students are talking in a language they don't understand and yet their 30-year-old colleague feels like they have it all going on, then suddenly there's this huge disconnect. And so when we typically see adults coming into our programs, one of four things has happened. Uh, one of them is they've been passed over for a promotion by someone younger. Hmm. And they realize that they just don't have all of the capability they should or knowledge of the changing world. They've been made redundant and actually their job has gone and, and there isn't a, a similar job they can go into because the whole sector has changed. The birth of a child. And so suddenly they're seeing life through a, their children's eyes. They might have a 10 year old and realizing that everything that 10 year old is talking about, you know, they're at the at the dinner table talking about NFTs and cryptocurrencies and, you know, some computer game that they're on and, you know, in a language they don't understand. And the fourth is a loss of, of a, a loved one, particularly a parent, mm. where they suddenly have this idea that they're not here forever. And, but life is a lot of living ahead and how will they navigate that road ahead? So when we talk to them, you can almost pinpoint a major life event that has been the catalyst for someone to say, I actually need to to really understand this new world. And I need to understand on a level where I can have a conversation with confidence about the new world. So if you're teaching, it doesn't matter if you're teaching uh, young children or you're teaching at, at a higher education, that is an entirely different group of people with a different expectation. And they live in a different, you know, it's almost parallel universe. And that's before we even start talking about things like the metaverse and people you know, moving into these virtual spaces. Right. So. Wherever I am, it feels like the acceleration is happening and now there is a, a rising awareness of, let me call them adults, grown-ups, whatever you want to call them, who are saying, okay, I want, to be, I want to be part of that in a very constructive way and I'm going to spend some time understanding what happens next. Yeah, and you're a fantastic guest then for this program where we talk a lot about 21st century skills and the disruption of the, the skills economy that's out there, the new and emerging skills, the more technical ones generally called web three skills, you know, harder, uh, technical skills around extended reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, AI, the blockchain, crypto, all those things are harder skills. And then the, the so-called softer skills, which are, I've heard called power skills and durable skills which generally folks who are further on in their career may have developed the ability to, to lead a team, the ability to collaborate, the ability to embrace difference. It, it's obviously a mixed bag for all of us, but as someone who's deeply embedded in this landscape of disruption around skills and thinking about the future of work, can you share some of your thinking around the the types of skills that are important to master and how you think about the blend between harder technical skills and more social, emotional, durable, collaborative skills? Sure. The great thing about soft skills, uh, that they're very transferable, you know, they they can move sector to sector, job to job, and you build on them and the more resilience you build and the more you're capable of identifying situational changes you need, you know, how do you address one? audience versus another, that is one of those things you definitely improve on as time goes on. Obviously, it's almost to the detriment of those hard skills, which are constantly changing, you know, ever evolving, and they feel just by the very nature of the language around them, they are complex and they're non-familiar for, for the majority of adults that didn't grow up with these tools, unless they've come out of the tech industry. 
But I think there's another another set of expectations now of we've moved away from this command and control era with you know the leader in front of the classroom or the leader at the top of the, the organization having all the answers and everybody aspiring to listen to the, the town hall meeting and let's all follow that person to this much more distributed leadership model where listening to the expertise in the room. And one of the analogies, which I've always found really useful, regardless of which industry you're in, is the difference between cooperation and collaboration. Mm. And I'll just explain that. I'm hoping the idea of a potluck dinner makes sense to you. Yeah. Fantastic. That's good. Okay. So you imagine a potluck dinner and you've been asked to bring something along. You would bring the dish that you're known for. So if you make the most incredible barbecued ribs, that's what you're going to bring. Mm-hmm. Or if you make a great risotto, maybe you bring the risotto. Mm-hmm. And so what happens, you have a group of people who probably bring their favorite, you know, well-practiced dish, put it on the table. Everybody goes, wow, look at this feast of food. It's amazing. Everybody enjoys it. They go home. There's been no learning. There's been no interaction around that. There's been really no stretch of, of, of anything beyond the enjoyment of the food. Mm-hmm. If you did that instead of a cooperative dinner and you did it as a collaborative dinner, you would say, bring some ingredients. So everybody turns up and some people bring, you know, this spinach and some bring chocolate and some bring chilies and some bring rice and whatever it might be. You put it all on the table and you say, well, we've all got lots of things here. What could we do with this? Mm. Let's find recipes. Let's do things we've never done before. Let's work together to create a dinner that actually is something we've never tried. It may not work, but actually we're all going to learn from this experience and do something new Mm. and so they still get a great dinner they still get to enjoy it but they've actually had a much richer deeper learning experience and so i think if you use that as an uh, analogy this idea of bringing together people to put everything on the table and saying what do we have in this room what skills what can we bring together so there's not one person leading with their favorite recipe it's actually this much more collaborative experience and so i think we have to understand how do we deploy that type of tactical approach to projects or moving things, you know, moving things ahead instead of saying one person's going to be responsible for this? Mm. Because actually we need all that diversity of thought and experience. We know we want the scientist and the mathematician, the musician and the young sort of computer person and the, the person with the 40 years of leadership experience all working together. Mm. And if we can do that, the power of that is incredible. And I think the tech industry know this the best. They are very good at pulling together very diverse teams, not just in um, diversity of of backgrounds, but actually a diversity of thinking styles and, and neurodiversity and, and bringing together this you know, range. They may not have the, the gender balance as strong, but they certainly consciously understand the benefit of diversity. And I yeah. think that's something we could all learn from. Yeah, absolutely. And the other element that this is making me think about is that beyond skill sets, there's also mindsets baked into everything that you're doing where seeking out difference, you know, being comfortable with distributed leadership, like some of those concepts cut across skills and in some way growth mindset, the willingness to, to lean in and continue to unlearn some things, even as you get older, in some ways there's a higher level framework to the thinking that I imagine is powering a lot of the strategic direction that you're taking. Look, I think the most important one to me is how do you build confidence? And it's really, we, you know, we think about the confidence needed of a teenager and trying to get them through those awkward teenage years and not lose their identity and not lose that kind of sort of ability to believe in themselves. But I think actually it's just as important as we tackle change as an adult, where it's, it's often very overwhelming, it's intimidating, it feels like everybody is in on the great story that you don't know and you don't understand. So one of the things we work with, and in fact, even yesterday I was teaching a master's class, it was a master of technological futures. And the, the students, we ended up talking about the benefit and importance of normality when you're doing change. And I'm a really big believer in rituals. You know, the things like a Sunday lunch with the family, that every Sunday you get together and have that lunch or that, that maybe it's something that you, you know, you play soccer with your son every, every Tuesday evening and it's, everybody knows what happens in that time. Hmm. I think one of the things when you have mindset is if you have everything changing at once, 
then actually it's really hard to stay on the, the glass half full side. It actually becomes very easy to be overwhelmed. So if anyone's listening to this and thinking, gosh, I'm really trying to get my head around all the stuff that's changing. I'm trying to adapt and adopt and do things very differently. Just make sure you still come back to some of those things that make you feel great. Mm. And often they are the most simple things. It's breaking bread on a Sunday, you know, at Sunday morning, or it's, it is those interactions or the, or the club that you belong to that you go and play sports or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And I think the other one is having this idea that how do you build the confidence that you can do it? So that for me, that's surrounding yourself with people who will believe in you and carry you together. So you don't do it alone. I think if you're trying to do change by yourself, that's almost an impossible task. Mm -hmm. And so if you're thinking about the future skills you might need and you suddenly realize like I really don't have any data analytical skills and everybody's talking about data analytics and, and I'm trying to understand what that means from these things that these, you know, these spreadsheets I'm getting, or I'm getting these visualizations and I have no idea how to interpret them, find others who are going through the same thing. And I think that collective approach to, to change is actually really important. It helps the mindset. It certainly gives you that growth mindset because people are saying, we can do it together. It's a bit like if you're losing weight or going to the gym, you do it. If you do it as a part of a program and with others, you're far more likely to make those changes. And I think we, we need to take the same approach to learning and, and adaptation as time goes on is, you know, not, don't treat it like a, a little qu quiet. Uh, I don't want to tell you when I'm learning because what if I'm not, it's a really big fear by a lot of adults is they've always been really strong learners, perhaps have been very academic or very smart in their, in their early years of their career. And they suddenly find themselves at a point in time, perhaps in their forties, fifties, where they're actually not sure that they would be as, uh, as articulate in their response or as you know, as much evidence of, of their, their talent and capability because they're getting measured on things they're not less comfortable about. Yeah. So they don't do it. They just say, well, I, don't, I just don't want to put myself in the risk of not looking smart. It is quite complicated. And, and one theme that I've heard a lot talking about leaders and leadership is becoming more comfortable showing your own vulnerability and not, to your, to your previous point, not holding on too, too covetously of the command and control top-down hierarchical framework, and then instead embracing that you're not the smartest person in the room. And if you're surrounded by people, each of whom can contribute in different ways, that, and then the ability to synthesize that and make decisions and, and get the buy-in. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know you do talk mid-career, but from what I'm seeing, there's a decent amount of leadership thinking that I think goes into this as well, where, you know, regardless of how you think of a leader, you know, in, in this distributed uh, workforce that we're talking about, leadership has to come from every dimension of your organization. But can you expand on what it takes to be a leader nowadays? So also you as someone who has been in a leadership role for the last 20 years in many different capacities, I'd, I'd love to get some of your reflections on this. Look, your observation, this change has definitely occurred. I, I think back in my earlier leadership roles and, and, and I mimicked some very powerful women. You know, I looked for female leaders and they were strong and stroppy. And in many cases, they, you know, they could really compete head to head with their male counterparts, yeah. which wasn't me individually. And I was very intimidated by them, but I, I mimicked as much as I could within the safety of who I was. Mm. It, it didn't work. You know, I, and in fact, I, I, you know, caught up with friends and staff from those times and they're saying, gosh, your style back then compared to you now, who is authentically who I am, you know, I'm the, the gooeyest, soft centered leader you'll ever find because actually I just believe in people. And I believe actually, if you believe in people, they know it and give them the ability to be trusted and actually give them the chance to fall on their own sword and not be judged or be penalized for doing something wrong. But actually if they front up and say, oh, they didn't work then there is a huge amount of trust that goes with that. So I think the empathetic leader is very much dominant leadership. We, we have a very empathetic prime minister here in, in New Zealand yeah. with the prime minister, Jacinda Ardern, and she's known for it. And I'm seeing that around the world. There's a lot more figureheads and prime ministers and presidents who are, are really extraordinarily brave and courageous but not in a sort of a demanding or commanding style, but actually much more in a, you know, I'm part of a team. I happen to have a skill around people, which is really, you know, in the end, a good leader is really good with people. Mm -hmm. And 
one of the interesting things I often work with mid-tier managers and they realize the only way for their career to progress is to take on more people in terms of direct reports. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't like managing other people. It's not their strong set. If they say, for example, they're an engineer, they'd be better off staying as an engineer and doing the thing they love and do really well than saying, hey, we can promote you to a mid-tier manager or a manager and you'll have five people reporting to you and you'll do less time on the tools. Yeah. Actually, I think we have to really, as a leader, identify the t other people who are really good at leading others and not just about the years in the job or seniority or even salaries. You know, I think people often sort of fall in love with this idea of more money and more responsibility, but actually end up in a job that they don't really love because it's not what they set out to do. Yeah. And so this style, I think, of leadership is becoming very pronounced. It has been celebrated by a new generation, you know, millennials, obviously, and also Gen Z, who are now in the workforce as, as the sort of the, the graduates coming out of our universities in that age group. They definitely identify much more strongly with leaders who, who can sort of, you know, be self-depreciating and say, I, I don't know the answer to this, but I'm sure in the room somebody does. Right. I always laugh, you know, it was the difference of signing off a few years ago. It was all like, you know, yours sincerely. And now I sign off with my staff, love Francis with a kiss, you know, <laughs> Yeah. and they know that me and, 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 and maybe because I'm older and I can feel comfortable doing that. And, and, but it's, I think that there, there is an expectation now that you're just part of a team. You have a certain skill set. And at the same time, I know when I have to get tough, there's a time in leadership, you still have to be able to say you're accountable for things. There is, it's not just all smooth sailing all the time, yeah. but I think for the most part, the more trust you give to people, the more they trust you, the more you get done and productivity is higher. Uh, you know, you, you're not having to crack the whip because people just naturally want to be involved with something that they feel good about. Mm. Yeah, and that in, in many ways, this is an argument for uh, more women in leadership roles, which is something I know you're passionate about. Also, you know, it's not like men are incapable of leading in this way as well. I think there are places where new models of male leaders who are showing that vulnerability are, are desperately needed, especially when some of these, some of the public figures that are out there are demonstrating the toxic masculinity angle around leadership styles, which truth be told, was probably the predominant style even 20 years ago, whatever, like there, there has been a, a gradual shift. And then there are also places where we're still seeing backlash against what I would characterize as progress frequently that causes folks of the old guard to dig in even more tightly, which is something we are seeing more broadly. I would love to take a step back and since you are someone who thinks about the future, we're an educational trend spotting show. Are there trends beyond what we've talked about so far that are capturing your imagination that you think folks who care about the future of learning, future of education, future of work should be paying attention to? I think the big ones for me in terms of education, there's a, a huge rise in micro credentials for badging, you know, these smaller bite-sized sort of units of learning that are really designed to top up what people know already or adjacent fields or areas where they just need some small amount. And we've definitely lent into that idea. So a lot more of our programs are based on micro-credentials. They are part-time 10-week blocks of learning and it could be in sustainability or it could be in disruptive technologies or entrepreneurship or whatever it might be. And what we've done is made them stackable so you can actually bring those credits together on top of each other and actually build up to a master's level. Mm. And be that when online learning, there are so many online platforms now, almost all of the best universities and higher education environments in the world now do some form of micro-credential or badging. So I think that's one, the, the, the three or four year undergrad degree, I think is really under pressure. You know, to go into a physical environment, into a lecture hall, makes no sense anymore. You know, if they're going to be together, make sure they're collaborating, make sure they're doing something that is actually tactile and worthwhile, or it's, it, it's an activity that, that would not work well or would not be ideal online. Mm -hmm. If it's something that they're just listening to a lecture, then make sure it is online or it is a podcast or it's something that's much more accessible. Yeah. So I think we really will have so much pressure on the traditional large physical institutes who are only offering scheduled face-to-face -face sessions. 
you know, the world is facing huge cost increases and inflation increases and, you know, petrol increases, housing, the rest of them. So the idea of dedicating three or four years of your life to a program where you might only have, you know, 20 or 10 hours of lectures in a week and you're, you're literally writing off the rest of the week because yeah. you have to work around the schedule, I think will be pushed increasingly by the next generation of Gen Z or Z who will come through and actually say, hang on, I need to be able to have a side hustle or another job. And so study has to fit around me because mm -hmm. I can't afford to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I think when we look at the, the workplace, I think everybody now knows that the idea of a nine to five in the office is gone. I mean, that, that circuit breaker happened. We don't have a going back to that office. And I, I think it would be either a very brave or a very silly employer who would think that was going to happen for anybody who's in the knowledge economy. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like? What does a distributed, flexible workforce look like? Here for me and actually all around the world, I'm watching the rise of a four-day working week. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, my, my team, our teams are asking for that, partially because there's higher burnout. It's hard to get away from work because it continues into your home life. Secondly, people are much more mindful now that they operate when they have less really hard, intensive hours, they have a better relationship with their kids, they have a better relationship with their families, yeah. they have more life enjoyment. And actually in every location and every company that's moved to a four-day working week has seen productivity rise. So even though they're only working 32 hours, it's had a positive impact. And so I think those are the sorts of things where we will have to start to think quite differently. Education will have to, in some ways, ad ad adjust as well because education, typically in the hours between nine and three or nine to five, depending on which country you're in, we're matching the industrial work model, mm -hmm. which is, you know, go to the factories, go to places where you had to take the kids somewhere while you went to work. And so I think more people will start questioning that. Is that the right way to be teaching from, you know, particularly from the time children are independent? and are able to make good informed decisions and balance. And perhaps it is much more of a blended education model in the same way we'll have blended work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, big changes are ahead. And I think we're seeing those changes and, and the more progressive companies and the more progressive countries are really embracing it very quickly. Yeah, that was great. We're getting close to time. I know you have a new book coming out as well called Future You. Could you talk to us a little bit about your book? Sure. So Future You, it is a book that came out just a couple of weeks ago around the world. And it's a book about why it's hard to face change and why we choose not to sometimes or choose to learn, even when sometimes our livelihoods depend on it. People walk away from a job because they just don't want to learn. And then I've actually used that and I've used my own life and things that happened through my life to kind of inform my decision and, and, and even down to people I've taught situations I've seen on the repetitive cycles of why do we do these things? Mm. And so yeah, future years, it's available on, I guess, on Amazon. Awesome. And I, and I think it'll be launching more broadly in the U.S. for our U.S. listeners, but it's already out there on Amazon. It's wonderful stuff. As we're wrapping up here, Francis, any concluding thoughts, anything to bring it home for our listeners? What, what should our takeaways be based on our limited time we've had with you today? I think if anyone's sitting out there thinking about, do they need to train? Do they need to be sort of leaning into this world that is, feels very disruptive? I would say 100% do it. You'll never regret it because actually the speed of change is increasing. We're living in more volatile times. A few weeks ago, we wouldn't be thinking about a, the potential of a war right on our doorstep. We wouldn't be thinking about some of the things we're seeing on a daily basis. If you're in education, students are facing things for the first time, which are, are truly terrifying. You know, they're seeing massive change. And, and, and so our roles as educators particularly is to understand what they're going through because, you know, we have the resilience to understand and normalize and we can logically work through some things which others can't. And, and as we were talking just before we started, it's been 40 years of, of pretty smooth sailing. So for a lot of people, this is really uncharted territory and change can be very powerful. It can be a really strong catalyst of positivity in our lives and it actually can make us feel much more engaged, involved and part of life in a really positive way. Awesome. And uh, real quick, can you explain to folks what a kiwi is? Sure can. A kiwi is a bird, not a fruit, although the fruit is very delicious and it does come from New Zealand. But the kiwi is a small flightless bird 
It's very nondescript. It's got a very long beak. It's brown and it has the most enormous egg. So the egg with inside the kiwi is almost like an ostrich egg. And yet the size of a kiwi is about the size of a duck. So uh, it makes no sense. It's a great bird. It's a great bird and it's okay to refer to folks from New Zealand as Kiwis. Certainly can. If you're providing additional value to me as an American in that context, I didn't realize Kiwi couldn't fly. Who knew? This is why we have podcasts. This is why we're tapping into folks. Not like, yeah, and they're nocturnal. So I've only ever seen a Kiwi once in my entire life. So not only are they small brown flightless birds, they also hide in the dark. So there you go. Francis Valentine, thank you so much for joining us on today's episode. Such a pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Awesome. And uh, just as a reminder, Francis is the CEO and founder of both the Mind Lab and Tech Futures Lab. She's also the author of a book titled Future You, which is on the horizon. Check it out. You should be able to find it on Amazon. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe, share the good word, tell your friends. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. 